Good evening, everyone. I'm Kevin Washburn, Dean of the University of Iowa College of Law, and I welcome you to a panel discussion entitled Pay for Play. Do I have music? Do I have a soundtrack? <laughs> Pay for Play, Should College Athletes Be Considered University Employees? This event is part of an ongoing series on policy challenges for Iowa and the nation hosted by Iowa Law, the University of Iowa, and the Board of Regents. The goal of the series, which was the brainchild of Regent David Barker, and his wife Sarah is here, he couldn't be here, but um, he, uh, it was his idea to create a forum to address controversial issues from all sides. And our first event was in 2021, and I think we did um, free speech and social media was the first event, but we've been doing these regularly since then. And um, the subjects have grown no controversial, but at least free speech and social media has been solved. <laughs> Tonight's event, indeed, is so timely that it's been difficult to plan. It's been, well, it hasn't been that stressful for me, but it might be, it's been some stressful for some people because it's moving so fast. It's, uh, everything's moving so quickly in this space. Um, all the logistics for tonight's event, by the way, were handled by Leslie Gannon at the College of Law. Where is she? So, there she is. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Leslie. Um, we are so happy to be joined by President Barb Wilson and Dr. John Lammers. Thank you for being here, too. It means a lot when you guys come out to all the events. Um, our event tonight is supported by the University of Iowa Sports and Recreation Management Program and its energetic director, Dan Matheson. Professor Matheson provided all the vision in putting together tonight's program. Dan will kick off the program in a minute or two by introducing our terrific panel and moderating this event. And I've been thinking of the program in my head as sports talk with Dan Matheson, sort of, with a great panel of people. Um, but, so let me introduce him a little bit more properly. And I'm not going to lie to you. Before coming to Iowa, Dan was a bit of a heel. Um, one of his jobs was working as an attorney handling enforcement actions against fine schools like this. He was working for the NCAA. And we love those NCAA infractions attorneys, don't we? Um, no booze yet, but it gets worse. Um, before that, Dan served as the director of baseball operations for the New York Yankees. There we go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In Boston, everybody would be booing, but, you know, at Harvard or something. But, but um, see, if I were, you know, doing this event somewhere like that, it would really be, get nasty. And it's old cap. Everybody's well behaved, but I'm a little bit disappointed in all of you. It's okay to boo a little bit. Um, you have to get past the Iowa nice. Is this a sports crowd or what? Um, so how about this? Dan got his undergraduate degree from Iowa State University over in Ames. <laughs> good, good. Just getting this crowd warmed up for you, Dan. That's all, just getting them warmed up. Okay, okay, and, and also, he got a law degree from the University of Minnesota. He's a golden gopher. He's a cyclone and he's a golden gopher. Um, and if that was the end of the story, we would never have him here tonight. He's too much of a heel. Um, but around 13 years ago, he started reforming himself. And um, he began his reform then, and he began to clean up. He moved to Iowa City. Um, he moved past his dastardly background and started making amends to Hawkeye Nation. Um, in 2011, Dan joined the faculty of the University of Iowa, and the rest is history. Today, Professor Matheson is leading and teaching in the Sports and Recreational Management degree program at the UI, and that's just his day job. He's also a very busy professor at the College of Law, where he does a number of things, um, including developing a lot of excellent sports-related teaching and programming for our law students in some classes. One of the things he's done is he ha has built a mock NCAA infractions enfor enforcement program where students work like they, you know, in, in the actual hearings um, that happen at NCAA. They, they do mock, mock programs like that. And that program is now all across the country. He started it, and it's now a national tournament. Um, Dan's an excellent teacher. He's a past winner of the President and Provost Teaching Award, um, which he won eight years ago. And I, if it could be, it can't it only be won once, or would, he would probably be a three-peater or a four-peater or something like that. He's a great teacher. I get to read his teaching evaluations every year, so I know. <laughs> Um, he's a cyclone and a gover, but during his time here, he's infiltrated the hearts and minds of many of us, and we are really lucky to have him here. He's gone from heel to hero, so I, I'll bring you Dan Matheson. Dan? <laughs> Hi, 
I don't know how to uh, follow that up. Uh, you, really, <clears throat> you really warmed them up for me. Uh, I, I, def I have a lot of students here tonight, and it's great to see all of you, but uh, it's very obvious that you're students because they always fill in from the back to the front, and there's always this vacancy up front. It feels like you're so distant from me. Um, but thank you all for being here. Thank you for the very generous introduction, Kevin. And thank you, uh, I want to recognize uh, Associate Dean Chris Cheatham of the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences, which is uh, my day job, and uh, my uh, DEO, uh, Department Chair Gary Pierce. Uh, really appreciate both of them being here. And uh, tonight's event, just like uh, the opportunities I have to teach, uh, with the College of Law and uh, with Sport and Recreation Management is an, one more example of the great partnerships, uh, the collaborative partnerships that exist on this campus. And one of the many reasons that I love being a part of the uh, University of Iowa community and uh, I'm very thankful to everybody uh, who made this night possible. And uh, we will get to introductions of our four panelists without whom uh, this night would not be possible. Uh, but, I mean, is there a better way to celebrate March Madness than uh, to talk about all the, the lawsuits swirling around college sports right now? I mean, leave it to the lawyers to take the fun out of college basketball, right? <laughs> The truth is, though, the question that we are here to consider tonight, whether student athletes are employees, is weighing more heavily on the minds of uh, many people in college athletics right, right now, like Marcus Wilson here from our athletics department, is weighing more heavily on them than who the next basketball national champions are going to be. To consider this existential question facing college sports, we've brought together a very special panel of attorneys with relevant experience and research to share. And we're looking forward to thought-provoking presentations, discussion, and questions, questions that I will have for the panelists and questions that I hope you will have. Uh, you will find note cards uh, at the ends of the rows, or if you're not at the end of a row, uh, ask somebody on the end of your row. Uh, you can uh, write out notes, and Leslie, the event manager extraordinaire will uh, collect those if you'll hold them up when we get to that stage. Um, now for our panelists, I will ask you to hold your applause until I've introduced all four of them. Uh, first up to my left is Professor Josh Lenz. Professor Lenz is a 2005 graduate of the University of Iowa College of Law. He made the right choice, I didn't. After law school, he worked as a litigator for five years uh, in St. Louis before joining Baylor University's athletics compliance staff from 2011 through 17. Since 2018, Professor Lenz has been a member of the University of Arkansas's Recreation and Sport Management faculty. He teaches sports law and college athletics courses, and his scholarship focuses on the intersection of law and college sports. And his latest and most important professional development, in my opinion, is that he has accepted an offer uh, to join our sport and recreation management faculty and continue his teaching here at Iowa in the fall. We're thrilled to have you joining our team, Josh. I told you to hold your applause, but that was worthy. That was worthy, yeah. Next up, Prof Professor Alicia Jessup. Professor Jessup is an associate professor at Pepperdine University, uh, which she went to great lengths to get here to be with us today. Thank you. I got an email from her at what must have been 2 o'clock in the morning for her uh, about flight cancellations, so thank you. Uh, professor Jessup is the chair of the sport administration program at Pepperdine. She's the founder of a sport media platform called Ruling Sports, and she previously was a sports business contributor to Forbes, The Huffington Post, CNBC, The Washington Post, and The Athletic. I, I don't think there's anybody left after that list. <laughs> Professor Jessup is an attorney licensed in California and Colorado, uh, and she practices of counsel at the sport law firm Daniel, Ebling, Messia, and Cohen. 
In her practice, she represents professional athletes, sport businesses, and investors in a range of transactional and intellectual property matters. Professor Jessup is Pepperdine University's faculty athletics representative to the NCAA and serves on the NCAA Division I Men's Basketball Oversight Committee. She's vice chair of the sports division of the American Bar Association's Forum on the Entertainment and Sports Industries and a past president of the Sport and Recreation Law Association. Her research focuses on promotion, advancement, and investment into underrepresented people and their business ventures, along with the application of law to athlete, artist, uh, and consumer welfare matters. She has spent the last decade advocating for college athletes to obtain greater rights through her research on the subject uh, by drafting several pieces of proposed federal legislation with a US senator and congressperson, and by signing on to an amicus brief to the Supreme Court in NCAA versus Alston, a case that we will discuss tonight. Thank you for being here, Alicia. Next up is uh, Libby Harmon. We'll get to the applause in just a moment. Next up is Libby Harmon. Uh, Ms. Harmon joined Nevius Legal in June 2023 and has provided counsel to and represented numerous athletes in a variety of matters, including NCAA investigations, eligibility uh, reinstatement matters, and hardship waivers. And she served as the appellate person in a K-12 Title IX complaint. Previously, Ms. Harmon spent a decade at the NCAA as an investigator. Her work included numerous high-profile NCAA investigations, including two of the men's basketball cases connected to the unprecedented federal bribery cases in the Southern District of New York. She has conducted hundreds of interviews, submitted dozens of briefs detailing NCAA violations, and argued cases before the Committees on Infractions. Prior to the NCAA, Ms. Harmon served as the Director of Compliance for Student Athlete Issues at the University of Michigan. A lifelong athlete, Ms. Harmon was a three-time captain of the University of Kansas track and field team where she competed in the pole vault and earned her undergraduate degree. She went on at Kansas to receive her law degree and has been licensed to practice in Indiana since 2012. Thank you for being here, Libby. Uh, last up, uh, but very, not at all least, is my old friend Jason Montgomery. Uh, Mr. Montgomery represents colleges, universities, conferences, athletes, and businesses nationwide in enforcement, eligibility, and legal and regulatory compliance matters related to athletics. In addition to his private practice, he has served in multiple regulatory positions at the NCAA, including as an investigator and an academic and membership affairs staff member responsible for waivers and rules interpretations. His unique background at the NCAA national office and thereafter as a compliance administrator on campus uh, allows him to analyze NCAA rules and other athletics issues from multiple perspectives, guide clients through regulatory processes efficiently, and engage in proactive planning related to regulations and limiting liability. When sensitive challenges and disputes do arise, uh, Mr. Montgomery works closely with clients for best possible outcomes. He aims to act as a true teammate in creating strategies that streamline compliance benchmarks and resolve disputes in the most effective manner possible, while never forgetting the most important goal, athletes' academic and athletic success. Thank you all for being here. Let's give our panelists that round of applause. Thank you. Before I yield the floor to the first of our panelists tonight, I want to set the stage for the tectonic shift that is facing college athletics right now. It didn't happen overnight, and the path that has led to this moment provides much needed context for a full discussion, discussion of the issues that we're going to have tonight. I want to begin by going back to 1984. In that year, the NCAA lost an antitrust lawsuit known as the Board of Regents case. In that case, 
the Supreme Court found that the NCAA's restrictions on the number of football games that could be televised each week were illegal restraints on trade and commerce under antitrust law. But there was a silver lining for the NCAA in that defeat. The Supreme Court acknowledged in its decision that some restraints on trade and commerce are necessary for college football to exist and wrote, quote, the NCAA seeks to market a particular brand of football, college football. The identification of this product with an academic tradition differentiates college football from and makes it more popular than professional sports to which it might otherwise be comparable, such as minor league baseball. In, in order to preserve the character and quality of the product, athletes must not be paid, must be required to attend class and the like, end quote. Athletes must not be paid. That dictum by the Supreme Court in 1984 became a foundation upon which the NCAA based its legal strategy and its justification for amateurism for decades to come. But the protection the NCAA relied on from that Supreme Court decision would eventually come to an end, which I will talk about in a moment. 20 years after that Board of Regents decision, legal challenges to the NCAA's amateurism rules began like a snowball at the top of a mountain that grew as it tumbled downhill. And today, the NCAA is at the bottom of that mountain looking up at an avalanche coming at it. I want to briefly walk you through a few of those important legal challenges to amateurism uh, that have uh, taken place over the past 20 years and set up the issues that we're considering tonight. First, in 2004, we have Jeremy Bloom. Jeremy Bloom uh, was a unique two-sport athlete who played college football at Colorado, but also was an Olympic-level skier. And he sued the uh, NCAA because the NCAA denied his request to, to sign name, image, and likeness deals as a skier outside of his college sport. Uh, that, this was long before our current NIL environment that we've uh, become so accustomed to. The NCAA won that lawsuit uh, and succeeded in holding off what was a very high-profile uh, challenge to its authority. But in doing so, it sparked a national debate over the fairness of its amateurism rules. Five years later, in 2009, the next legal challenge took Jeremy Bloom's fight one step further. Uh, that was a class action antitrust lawsuit known as the O'Bannon case. In that case, college athletes challenged the NCAA's amateurism rules that restricted them from profiting from their name, image, and likeness in video games. Uh, this, this was the lawsuit that brought down the very popular EA college sports games that probably many of you students here played while you were younger. The O'Bannon case was an antitrust case, uh, just like the Board of Regents case. So in deciding the O'Bannon case, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals was influenced by the Supreme Court's statement in the Board of Regents that athletes must not be paid. In the O'Bannon case, the court ruled that offering student athletes, quote, cash sums untethered to educational expenses is not minor. It is a quantum leap. At that point, the NCAA will have surrendered its amateurism principles entirely and transitioned from its particular brand of football to minor league status, end quote. That decision by the Ninth Circuit to protect NCAA amateurism rules against payments unrelated to educational expenses further emboldened the NCAA and further enraged a growing number of amateurism skeptics. Right around the same time as the decision in the O'Bannon case, another case challenging amateurism rules was decided in a different legal venue by the National Labor Relations Board. In 2014, the Northwestern Univers University football student athletes sought recognition as a labor union by the NLRB. In that case, an NLRB regional director 
found the football players to be employees of Northwestern. But on appeal, the full NLRB in Washington, D.C. chose not to exercise jurisdiction over the case because doing so, it said, would create instability in labor relations in college football. So the players couldn't form a union, but the NLRB clarified it was not deciding whether the regional director was right or wrong in finding them to be employees, which helped further stoke the flames of the debate. So in about a 10 year period, starting in 2004, you had the Bloom case, the O'Bannon case, and the Northwestern case. And while the O'Bannon and Northwestern cases were going on, another class action antitrust lawsuit known as the Alston case was filed against the NCAA and that one would end up going to the Supreme Court. The Alston case went a step further than the O'Bannon case in that the plaintiffs challenged any NCAA restrictions on college athlete compensation, not just NIL restrictions uh, in video games. But by the time that case was litigated up to the Supreme Court, it was trimmed back to a more limited focus on whether the NCAA was violating antitrust law by placing restrictions on educational benefits to student athletes. On that more limited question of educational benefits, the Supreme Court unanimously found the NCAA restrictions to be in violation of antitrust laws. And this is significant, uh, the Supreme Court rejected the NCAA's reliance on the Board of Regents' decision and its athletes must not be paid comment as being some sort of safe harbor to, uh, to protect the NCAA against amateurism challenges. The Supreme Court noted in Alston how dramatically the economics of college football had, uh, and sports, uh, college sports in general, had changed in almost 40 years since the Board of Regents case and emphasized that it would be unwise to rely on what was a stray comment by the Supreme Court uh, about student athlete compensation rules in Board of Regents uh, when those rules weren't even an issue in that case. Taking things one step further in the Alston case, Justice Brett Kavanaugh wrote a concurring opinion that signaled to future plaintiffs that at least one member of the Supreme Court would entertain a more expansive takedown of the NCAA's amateurism rules. Justice Kavanaugh delivered a searing indictment of amateurism that concluded with the following passage. Quote, nowhere else in America can businesses get away with agreeing not to pay their workers a fair market rate on the theory that their product is defined by not paying their workers a fair market rate. And under ordinary principles of antitrust law, it is not evident why college sports should be any different. The NCAA is not above the law." End quote. Ominous words from Justice Kavanaugh. That Alston decision came down a little less than three years ago. Since then, uh, the avalanche has officially hit the NCAA. I just want to briefly summarize before closing uh, the highlights or the lowlights, depending on your perspective, uh, from the past three years that are bearing down on the NCAA right now uh, in litigation that has an impact on this issue we are considering tonight. Number one, as we all know, NCAA student athletes gain the right to profit from NIL. Uh, and just about a month ago, the NCAA tried to enforce its limited guidelines on what you can and can't do with NIL. And in response, uh, they were slapped with another antitrust lawsuit and an injunction that's essentially blocking the NCAA from enforcing any limits right now on boosters using NIL deals to recruit student athletes to schools. Number two, the general counsel of the NLRB stated her position that even using the term student athlete uh, could be a violation of the National Labor Relations Act if it misleads players to believe that they're not employees. And in response to that guidance, a complaint was filed with the NLRB against the University of Southern California, the PAC-12 conference, and the NCAA, and we are now awaiting a decision 
on whether USC athletes were misclassified as student athletes and whether the Pac-12 and NCAA are legally joint employers with USC of their athletes. Number three, just last month, Dartmouth College's men's basketball athletes were, formed, uh, were found to be uh, employees of Dartmouth uh, by a regional director of the NLRB, just like uh, the Northwestern football student athletes almost a decade ago. The athletes have since then voted to form a labor union, uh, and Dartmouth is appealing the decision and taking steps that could lead to a federal court case on the issue. Number four, a group of former college athletes are suing their schools and the NCAA for violations of the Fair Labor Standards Act. Uh, they claim that they were employees of their schools and should have received hourly minimum wage and overtime pay. And finally, possibly the biggest legal threat to the NCAA is another class action lawsuit uh, known as the House case. If the House case goes to trial and the NCAA loses, uh, it could lead to multiple billions in damages that the NCAA could owe. In the House case, the plaintiffs are former student athletes from the pre-NIL days who claim that they lost out on NIL revenue because of the NCAA's illegal uh, compensation restrictions. Let me catch my breath there for a minute, because that is a very active docket. Meanwhile, as all of this is unfolding, uh, the NCAA has been lobbying Congress for federal legislation that would create some form of statutory non-employee status for student athletes and uh, statutory antitrust protection for the NCAA. And quick shout out to a Hawkeye, uh, Sarah Valero, who graduated from our Sport and Recreation Management Program in 2018, now works for the NCAA in Washington, D.C. Uh, for the NCAA's Office of Government Relations. Go Hawks. <laughs> Clearly, our panel has a lot to unpack around these issues. Uh, the snowball that started uh, rolling downhill with Jeremy Bloom's help uh, has become an avalanche of legal challenges to the NCAA's bedrock principle that athletes are amateurs, not employees of their schools, their conferences, or the NCAA. And with that set up, it's now time to turn the floor over to our panelists. Each panelist will present different considerations on either side of this issue, and they all have terrific insight, experience, and research to offer. Our goal tonight is to enlighten, inform, and spark some questions. Uh, and after our panelists present, they will uh, be seated to consider questions together in a discussion format. Uh, and finally, uh, as I said, we will have time for audience questions as well. So uh, start thinking about those. With that, let's welcome our first panelist, Professor Josh Lenz. Right. Uh, thank you, Dan, and I know I speak on behalf of uh, my fellow esteemed panelists. Uh, thank you for hosting us, organizing this, and, um, inviting us to come. Uh, Dean Washburn, uh, thank you as well. Uh, thanks to all the attendees, and uh, Leslie, thank you uh, for all the organization. Um, and, and also thank you for thanking other people that were on my list, so uh, appreciate that. Um, Dan, I, I know you'd agree with me uh, from your time with the Yankees that the role of the leadoff hitter is sometimes just to get on base and let the heavy hitters do their job, right? Um, so that's kind of my role tonight is to uh, set the stage for the, the heavy hitters behind me. Um, and I want to uh, do that by introducing some of the NCA's arguments and positions against student-athlete employee, employee classification. Uh, with, a, with a caveat that I might not necessarily agree with some or all of these arguments, uh, but again, I'm, I'm just lead off hitter trying to uh, set up my uh, big hitters behind me. Um, and, and for me, I think the NCA's positions uh, fall into four different categories. Uh, one being terminology, the second being compensation, the third being control, and the fourth being paternalism. Um, so a little bit about each of those. 
t when we think about terminology, um, I think we have to talk about a couple different terms, one being amateur or amateurism, and the second being the term student athlete. And I know you thought that uh, we were done talking about history, but I'm gonna go back even before the Board of Regents case, and actually go back over 100 years, um, the NCAA was formed in the early 1900s, and about 10 years later, in 1916, the NCAA put out, uh, or, or, or disclosed its definition of the term amateur, um, which they said at the time was an individual who participates in an activity as an avocation, okay? Um, trying to paint a picture that those individuals who put on a jersey or a uniform or a singlet and go represent a university on the field, on the court, on the diamond, in the pool, et cetera, um, they're doing that as students who happen to participate in an, in an extracurricular activity. And so the NCAA introduced this term in 1916 and we're still using it over 100 years later. And if you look in the NCAA's 486 uh, page manual of rules, you see the term student athlete, what, hundreds of times, thousands of times maybe. Um, but in the, um, we've seen this term affirmed uh, in legal cases down through time. Um, and so that's why the NCAA has, has stuck with it as long as it has. Um, and we've all seen those commercials that uh, these collegiate athletes who represent us, they're students first, athletes second, right? You've all seen that and heard that. Um, and at, these athletes go pro in something other than, than their professional sports. Um, and when it comes to the term student athlete, we've, we've got to go back to 1955. And uh, there was an individual named Ray Dennison who played football at Fort Lewis A&M and in, on the opening kickoff of a game, uh, very unfortunate incident, his, his skull was crushed on the opening kickoff. And he passed away two, two days later from, from those injuries. Um, his wife filed a workers' compensation claim against Fort Lewis A&M. And it was during this time that Walter Byers, who was the NCA's first executive director, held that position from 1951 to 1987, so this is uh, very early in his term. Walter Byers introduces the term student athlete and actually mandates that NCA staff use this term. Again, to try to paint a picture uh, that these individuals who represent us, uh, they're different from their, their counterparts in professional sports, right? They've gotta go to class and they're students first, et cetera. Um, Walter Byers' use of that term helped persuade uh, Colorado Supreme Court to affirm the denial of workers' compensation benefits for, for Ray Dennison. So this is a, another example of the legal system buying uh, some of what the NCAA was selling. Uh, we saw in the Board of Regents case that uh, Professor Matheson discussed, um, Justice Stevens actually uh, made an allusion to the need to protect the revered tradition of amateur athletics. Um, and now, you know, we're now calling that dicta, but again, another example of the legal system uh, latching on to the NCA's messaging. So uh, terminology has helped shape the NCA's legal positions as it relates to student athlete employment, as has the, the notion of compensation. And we know that the NCA allows universities to provide our athletes with scholarships up to the cost of attendance. We know that uh, in some of our sports, those are partial scholarships, but we can also provide our athletes with, with food and gear and things like that. Um, but under NCA rule, we can't directly pay our athletes a, a wage or a salary for going out and representing, representing us on the field, on the diamond, on the court, et cetera. And recently in the uh, Johnson versus NCA case, which is that Fair Labor Standards Act case that uh, Professor Matheson mentioned, uh, the, NCA, the uh, NCA's attorneys were asked to defend the position that we, universities, can't provide athletes with a wage 
for representing us. And the NCAA's attorneys responded that our student athletes aren't employees, they're not professionals because they don't expect to get compensated, which um, is like a very circular argument. Um, and it reminds me of when you know, my four-year-old asks if, why he has to have carrots uh, so he can have a cookie for dessert. And I say, because I'm your dad and I told you so, right? Um, so we've got the compensation issue that I know uh, will be talked about here. Um, and then I think another category of uh, the NCA's positions on this employee issue would be the, the notion of control. And I, I know uh, Professor Jessup is gonna talk about control a lot, um, but the NCA has said that we, we universities and it, the NCA, don't exert sufficient control over our athletes such that under the laws, they are, they are student athletes, or they are employees. And the NCAA has pointed to a couple different things uh, to, to back up that argument. One being, uh, by NCAA rule, we can, our, our coaches in our sport programs can only require our student athletes to participate in what we call countable athletically related activities, which is a fancy way of saying practice and competitions and workouts and film review. We can only require that for 20, week, 20 hours a week when athletes are in season. Well, the NCAA says that's not sufficient control uh, that's only 20 hours a week when in, we know in reality that it often exceeds 20 hours by a long shot. Um, another thing that the NCA points to to assert that we don't have sufficient control over our athletes is the fact that we can't take away a student athlete scholarship or reduce their scholarship based on performance reasons, right? So in, in a game tonight, in a March Madness game, which by the way, thank you for being here when there's games on, uh, if somebody misses a game winning free throw or turns the ball over in overtime, we can't take away that student athlete scholarship because of that. Um, whereas in the, in the pros, we know that that can happen and that does happen all the time. So that uh, the NCAA points to those scholarship rules as an argument as to why the universities and the NCAA don't exert sufficient control over student athletes such that they are employees under the laws. Now, as a former college athletics administrator, um, I think I can, I can say uh, we have a history in college athletics of being very paternalistic with our student athletes and telling them we know what's best for you and, and you just need to trust us. And some of the NCAA's arguments against student athlete employee classification I think fall in this paternalistic category and speaking of scholarships, this is one of those areas where the NCAA has said, depending on how bargaining would go, if you wanna be a, an employee student athlete, you might no longer get an athletic scholarship. So these scholarships that you have that might be worth $30,000 on some campuses or $70,000 on some campuses, you might not get an athletic scholarship anymore if you're now going to be an employee. Or at the very least, you're gonna be taxed on it. And you're gonna be taxed on or have to pay for food, your medical care that you get for free now, and, and that nice travel that we provide you as well. So an example of a paternalistic argument there, um, the NCA has also suggested that our international student athletes, if they're deemed employees and they're here on an F1 visa to attend school, that that could jeopardize their ability to, to stay in our country. We know that uh, NIL has sh shined a light on our international student athletes and some of the legal issues that relate to them being able to use their name, image, and likeness for compensation. So the NCAA has, has brought this up in the employee context as well. And while we're talking about uh, these paternalistic arguments, the NCAA has, has told us and, and some athletics administrators across the country have told us if we start having to provide more compensation to student athletes, that's, a, that's an added expense for our athletics departments without a corresponding increase in revenue. So we might have to start making some tough decisions about some of our sport programs who might not bring in much revenue. We might have to start cutting some of our athletics programs that, that don't bring in the revenue that some of the more notorious do. 
Um, and so that would implicate Title IX, which the ANCA also points to if we start having to pay student athletes a, a wage or a salary, that Title IX would apply there and create more, more potential legal issues. So we should just have one big federal law that would cover all this and have a provision in it where student athletes cannot be uh, employees. Um, so those are some of the, the NCA's positions and legal arguments against student athlete employee uh, classification. Um, so with that, hopefully I've gotten on base for you and uh, you can, you can uh, drive in a run here, Alicia. You know, hopefully. <laughs> You're, you're well well on base, so maybe maybe rounding third. Um, I, I want to echo the thanks. This is a fantastic event. I, I appreciate the Iowa welcome and also um, echo the remarks of choosing to be here instead of watching the men's tournament. I'm sure if this was tomorrow, we would not have the same turnout. So go, Caitlin. Go, team. Um, first, I, I'm going to go a little bit off the script. I planned when I was listening to Dan's remarks, the quotation that was working through my head comes from none other than Albert Einstein and the quotation goes the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result um, and I, I think that's where we are in college athletics and before I dig into my remarks um, I did not plan this for my life I have spent the last decade making the rounds, losing time with family, losing time with friends, doing things like this. In my free time, I fly to Washington, D.C. I take meetings with senators and congresspeople and anyone who will give me the time of day to tell them what I'm about to tell you. And th there's several reasons why I do that. Um, you'll, you'll learn a little bit more about me in a second, but frankly, I shouldn't be here today given where I come from. And so I realize I'm in a position of power to speak up for those who, gosh, I'm getting emotional, um, those who maybe can't speak for themselves. My academic career began at the University of Miami. <clears throat> Excuse me, <laughs> this was not on the script. There I met a young man who grew up living in a park slide. Th th think about this for a second. That this young man's home was a plastic slide. His mother was addicted to crack cocaine, his father serving a 60-year prison sentence for, meeting a, for beating a man close to death. Um, but somewhere along the line, someone came into this young man's life and said, football is the way out. And he bought the story. He, he bought the story that football was the way out and access to a college education would change his life. Um, when he got to me, he was classified as a junior. He had traversed across two top 50 universities, coast to coast. He was in class every single day. He participated. His answers were correct when he participated. And then I got his test and the score didn't match the in-class participation. So I held him back and I said, what happened? He said, oh, it was rivalry week. I said, that's not what happened. And he goes, what are you talking about? I go, what, what happened here? Why is this your test score? And he said, well, he, he said, I don't know what you're talking about, but I said, do you know how to read? And um, you, you might not be able to tell, I'm five foot four. At the time, I was probably 30 pounds skinnier, so I'm not a very big person at the time. And he weighed close to 300 pounds and was probably six foot four, six foot five. And he felt like he was caught. And I said, you're not in trouble because you didn't do this and we're gonna fix it, but can you read? And he said, uh-uh. And, and that's when I realized I was operating in a system and it's not what I set out to do. If you follow my journey in sports, I've had the privilege of writing for some of the greatest publications in the world. And when I started in journalism, you can go back to the very end of ruling sports. I said, I believe that there are good stories about sports in this world. I am tired of hearing the negative stories, particularly about the NCAA. I knew there were good stories out there and I set out to tell them. 
Um, but very quickly, I realized that were, there were some problems and I had a front row seat to identifying them and addressing them. So now I'm gonna go on script. It's easy to paint the NCAA as the big bad wolf and admittedly it's something that I have done, but doing so loses sight of how we got to where we are today. Since the filing of O'Bannon, the focus on college sport has shifted from the field of play to the court of law. Hundreds of millions of dollars have been spent on legal fees only for massive blows to be dealt at every level of the American court system to the NCAA system of governance. In fact, in two legal challenges the association faces today, the House and Hubbard cases, it risks the possibility of having to pay damages greater than $5.1 billion. Repeated defeat calls for a scapegoat, and in the world of college sports, the easy scapegoat to blame is the head governing body for college sport. The story though of how we got where we are today, where examining whether college athletes are employees is something we're all spending our time doing, doesn't begin with O'Bannon as we've examined here already. Nor does it start with NIL in 2021. Um, I, I agree with Josh, and if I could redo this, I would go back to 1906. Um, I start 73 years ago though with the 1951 NCAA convention. And as I tell this story, I'm going to let you decide where blame lies. Is it with the head governing body? Is it with the universities? Is it with the media companies? Is it good old American greed? Or perhaps can we stop laying blame and recognize that there is enough at the table for all to adequately be fed? 24 years before that fateful 1951 convention, a 21 year old who lived the first 14 years of his life without electricity unveiled an invention that would change the world. In a lab on San Francisco's Green Street, Philo T. Farnsworth wired to his fundraiser, quote, the damn thing works, when after years of thinking, his contraption transmitted the first electronic television image. It would be an understatement to say that television changed the American way of life. In 2023, 97% of the 125 million households in this nation owned a television. The average American spends three hours a day watching that device. Binge watching has become a common aspect of today's existence, but Farnsworth invention hadn't proliferated American society in 1951. In fact, at that time, 96% of American households own a radio where only 12% owned a TV. As we are experiencing today with artificial intelligence, the potential reach and impact of new technology can spur fear in a populace awaiting its full rollout. So it's not surprising that the three person committee charged by the NCAA with figuring out what to do with what was called the quote television problem perceived that television posed the possibility of shaking up the status quo. If fans could watch games on TV, would they attend in person? If they didn't attend in person, what would happen to athletic department revenue? The committee determined, quote, that the television problem is truly a national one and requires collective, that's the key word there, collective action by the colleges. This is where the plot thickens. As the main character of our story, the NCAA's attempt to solve a, quote, problem ended in actually creating a bigger one, one that would embed the organization in decades worth of legal battles that it continues fighting today. To get the television problem under control, the association launched an association-wide TV plan that limited football teams' exposure to two games per season. When one school, Penn, and I'm not talking Penn State, I'm talking about the Ivy League school, which had televised all of its home games in the decade prior pushed back, the association threatened to kick it out and every team that had it scheduled for games that season canceled those games. So needless to say, Penn acquiesced and hopped back on the system. So to address the television problem, excuse me, thus the system to address the television problem went unfettered for over 30 years. In 1981, modifications were instituted into the plan wherein the NCAA negotiated an overarching four-year, nearly $132 million deal with ABC and CBS. Each of the networks would carry 14 games per season. However, while they could negotiate directly with the schools the right to carry their games, there were limitations around what games could be covered. Schools could only be shown um, no more than six times in a two-year window, four of which nationally. And they would be paid out of that $132 million pot with the NCAA specifying ideas 
but not requirements for how the money could be allocated. Since the turn of the 20th century, so this is the 1890s coming into the 1900s, um, marketplace competition has been a distinguishing aspect of the American economy. On July 2nd, excuse me, July 2nd, 1890, Congress enacted the Sherman Antitrust Act. We are living today in a period of wide division in our American Congress, but this was a piece of federal legislation that everyone was on board with. One congressperson voted against it and it passed unanimously in the Senate. This law was enacted to combat the rise of trust that thwarted competition in this nation, like the Standard Oil Trust. Um, and so it was in the spirit of competition that in 1981, the NCAA's then unchallenged television plan received its first real shakeup. I don't consider Penn's attempt a real shakeup because they backed down too quick. That summer, a group of schools organized as something called the College Football Association, hereafter the CFA, and they went to ABC and CBS's competitor, NBC, and negotiated their own TV agreement. Pretty smart. Um, needless to say, the, NBC, excuse me, the NCAA did not appreciate this because it would give these schools, quote, an unfair competitive advantage to have more of their games broadcast on television and subsequently the ability to generate even greater revenues. Unlike Penn, though, two of the CFA schools, Oklahoma and Georgia, lawyered up. They sought a preliminary injunction preventing the association from disciplining them or interfering with their contract. Three years later, the case reached the United States Supreme Court. The 7-2 to two decision by the court in Board of Regents versus NCAA deemed that the NCAA's television plan violated the Sherman Act as it amounted to a restraint on trade and price fixing. This decision single-handedly reshaped the landscape of intercollegiate athletics forever. That's because it opened up the marketplace for college sports TV rights, and the market quickly responded. Where once, 82 schools fought for a piece of a $132 million deal, now schools and conferences could individually land lucrative deals expanding their exposure and coffers. Notre Dame was the first to the market. I always love asking people who say that they're Notre Dame fans if they went there, like nine times out of 10, they didn't go there. And when you unpack why they're a Notre Dame fan, it's because they grew up watching the games on NBC. Um, they were first to market striking a five-year, $30 million deal. And then the Southeastern Conference was the next to follow with its first conference deal, inking a five-year, $100 million agreement with CBS that continued until last year. Considering the athletic success of these programs across the last four decades, what opportunity was born from this initial financial advantage? Today, the valuation of the broadcast agreements for just the four biggest NCAA D1 conferences, the ACC, Big Ten, Big 12, and Southeastern conferences, along with the association's deals for Men's March Madness, the NCAA's other 40 championships, and then the separately organized college football playoff, top $36.4 billion, okay? So we're not talking about mid-major conference TV deals, we're not talking about D2 or D3. $36.4 billion. That's a far cry from the $132 million allocated in 1981, which adjusted for inflation would be worth about $450 million today. This influx of broadcast revenue into the college sport ecosystem has brought increased spending. In 2022, Football Bowl subdivision head football coaches saw a 15.3% rise in their average annual salaries. This is coming out of COVID. Ask the average American worker what raise they saw in 2022. USA Today data shows that public Power Five conference schools will pay their head football coaches an average annual salary of $6.2 million. These schools also pay their head men's basketball coaches average annual salaries of 3.35 million. In fiscal year 21 to 22, D1 FBS programs spent $1.86 billion on college coaches' salaries and another $2.04 billion on facilities and equipment. That same year, $1.19 billion was spent on athletic scholarships. I wish I had a whiteboard to write the number. So we're spending more on coaches' salaries and facilities than we're spending on the entirety of college athlete scholarships. 
We are living in an age where there is infinite money to pay an in-demand coach and install lazy rivers and putt-putt courses in athletic facilities, but mention paying college athletes and suddenly the well dries up. That brings me to the employee question. And while I've been talking at you for a bit some time, it's important that you know a little bit more about me. First, I'm a big believer in the power of education. I'm a first generation college student. My father, who experienced homelessness as a child, preached to me that education was my way out. I bought the sermon. I've been privileged with an incredible life and career thanks to my undergraduate and legal educations. I also understand the value of a college scholarship. My father spent 40 years working on a factory line in the Coors Brewing Company. He and my mother provided me with a great life and home, but they didn't have the cash to finance my legal education. I was 38 years old when the $100,000 I borrowed to pay for that education was finally paid off. I say that to make apparent that I don't tread lightly when I say that most revenue producing college sport athletes are employees. Let me be clear, I do not believe that every college athlete is an employee. Rather, I believe that the two regional NLRB offices in the Northwestern and Dartmouth cases and the head NLRB in the Northwestern case got it right when they said that the right to control test is the correct test to apply to assess whether a college athlete is an employee. The right to control test looks at the level of control an employer exerts over how a worker does their job by evaluating a set of factors. The greater the level of control exerted across those factors, the more likely it is that a worker is an employee who can access the benefits of the National Labor Relations Act. I'm not gonna go through the factors because that would be kind of boring, not to say it's gonna be boring if someone else does it, but I'm going to give you some examples of control that I've seen in my experience as a journalist, as a lawyer, as a professor. Here's why I've seen control. It's not seeing the men's basketball players in my class at the University of Miami for close to a month during the school year when they went on to win the NIT. It's not because they were ditching. Those young men were always in class. They weren't in my class that month because the university kept them out on a business trip and kept them in New York or the Northeast instead of bringing them home to go to school. It's a college football player falling asleep in the front row of my class because the television network scheduled a midweek game in a different state and he didn't get home until 4 a.m. It's the quarterback in my class staying afterward to ask me if I know what the symptoms of a concussion are. When I tell him, no, I'm a lawyer, not a doctor, and ask why he's asking, he says, did you see what happened to me? No, I say. He says, my molar got knocked out in the game and coach told me to stop being a P word and go back and play. Think about your molar getting knocked out. The, the amount of force that has to come across your head for a molar to fall out and then not to be held out for one play seems a little problematic to me. It's the student I met who I mentioned earlier who had the reading skills of probably a sixth grader but made it into two top 50 universities because he had NFL level talent. It's a student not being able to pick a science major because it conflicts with their practice schedule. It's me spending my free time helping young men who played college sports around this nation find jobs after their playing career ends because as one who competed at the University of my, uh, Missouri told me, nobody ever told him what he was capable of other than football and the football program demanded so much of their time that they didn't gain internship experience or meaningful networks during their college experience. <clears throat> Coming back to where I started, I don't think the head governing body for college sports wanted to be where we are today, where very valid arguments exist for the employee status of college athletes. Some may say that their television plan was an attempt to hold mo monopoly power but I prefer to give them the benefit of the doubt. I think they wanted to preserve the amateur nature of college sports and keep greed out of the game. But the Supreme Court's decision in 84 opened Pandora's box, and the reality of college sports today is that it is a 25 billion annual generating enterprise whose power and control is largely held by media companies and the conferences benefiting grandly from those media deals. 
These media companies call all the shots. They schedule the games. They drive the bargaining power at the negotiation table to the point where West Coast schools leave historic conferences to join East Coast schools, increasing both the travel footprint and missed class time for their college athletes and the revenues that said schools generate. D1 revenue producing college athletics is not an extracurricular. It is big business. We see this in that the expenditure for college coaches' salaries and facilities often topples those of their professional counterparts. We know it's a big business because schools that say they don't have money to pay college athletes are spending tens of millions of dollars on lobbyists, hundreds of millions of dollars on legal fees, and possibly billions of dollars in legal damages to preserve the status quo. As I mentioned at the outset, Repeated, de repeated defeat in the court of law calls for a scapegoat. Who got us to where we are today? I'll leave that for you to consider. But as sport tells us, repeated loss also calls for a new game plan. And if the NCAA wants to put an end to the litany of legal challenges it faces, it needs to turn course. Turning course requires more than accepting that college athletes can benefit from the right of publicity that is afforded to every American. College athletes didn't gain some new right. Their, their right was finally restored to them through NIL. It requires coming into compliance with the law in full, and such necessitates understanding when and how the right of control test indicates that some, namely Division I revenue producing sport college athletes are employees of their respective universities. I know what some of you are thinking right now. Here are some questions that might be rolling through your head. But where is the money going to come from to pay these athletes? Two, is this the end of women's and Olympic sports? What are the unintended consequences of this legal status? I've already talked a lot, so I'm not going to address those in full, but I'm happy to more, but I'll give you a few thoughts on each. I tell my students to question everything, so I hope that you'll do the same. Don't buy that there is no money in the system. Likely, this will require the reallocation of funds. Top college coaches will see pay reductions. Strength trainers will no longer earn $1 million per year. The stadium and facility spending boom will slow. Beyond that, a review of Power 5 Conference School's 990 forms, one of my current favorite activities, shows that there's cash in the coffers. We were told that NIL would mean the death of women's and Olympic sports. That threat has not become reality. Instead, we are living in a time where thanks to an incredible athlete from your own university, women's college basketball is seeing unprecedented success. We see from the viewership and ticket sales numbers for women's college basketball this season that opening up a market can produce greater demand for a product. Olympic athletes now have longer windows also to financially benefit from their incredible gifts. What though of the unintended consequences? First, we must recognize that the potential horror stories thrown around by those against recognizing the employee status of D1 revenue producing sport college athletes are already true. Th these things are already happening on college campuses. People warn that if college athletes are recognized as employees, they would be, quote, fired for poor, for, poor, for, for, poor performance. Tell me what is different between that scenario and a coach maybe one of the greatest coaches in college football history, routinely gray-shirting college athletes to build winning teams. People today, sport, people today say sport is the wild, wild west. My maternal grandfather was a cowboy, and I'm not sure he would agree with that analogy. But the system is currently be sh being shaken by the slow breakdown of the cartel with new additions like NIL and the transfer portal. The NCAA continues unsuccessfully and to the tune of millions of dollars in lobbying fees trying to persuade Congress to grant it antitrust immunity and deem college athletes to not be employees. The likelihood of Congress passing such bills is as good as Caitlin Clark not being the number one overall WNBA draft pick. It's nil. If the NCAA wants to tame the transfer portal and ensure college athletes are protected in their NIL dealings, the law offers a different, more expedient solution. Recognize the employee status of revenue producing college sport athletes. Doing so would allow the college athletes to widely unionize. I can get into the joint employer theory to explain why that is. Resultantly, the NCAA could then negotiate a collective bargaining agreement limiting things like compensation, creating NIL boundaries, 
and putting guardrails around transferring along with much more. Such restrictions would put to rest the myriad antitrust challenges that the NCAA faces thanks to the applicability of the non-statutory labor exemption. Similarly, like the players' associations for professional athletes do, the college athletes' unions could enact rules governing the behavior of agents representing college athletes and NIL deals to better safeguard that marketplace. Finally, it would also put an end to the hundreds of millions of dollars in legal fees the association and schools have paid defending the status quo and end the ongoing awarding of antitrust damages untold sums of which have been funded by university student fees and have subsequently contributed to America's growing student debt crisis. I've been at this for over a decade. Uh, 10 years ago this week, I gave a speech at the University of Kansas that was controversial at the time. I argued that college athletes' right of publicity should be recognized just as every other American's is. Now, in the next 10 years, what we stand to see is a breakup of the band where the schools who wanted to earn and are earning significant broadcasting revenue and those who merely wanted to give students an opportunity to develop talents through sport will realize that they're at a legal crossroads and they can't continue traveling on the same path. Thank you. Thanks, Alicia. I think you set me up well. Um, so first of all, I want to thank Dan again quickly, um, Dean Washburn, as well as uh, Regent Barker um, for this opportunity, as well as Leslie for, for organizing this. I'm happy to be here um, and greatly appreciate the opportunity. So I'm going to be really focusing on how employment status could benefit athletes, but really addressing how that status might affect our non-revenue in Olympic sports. I'm a former track and field student athlete, so speaking from experience there. I'm going to touch on some solutions on how to preserve those opportunities for our non-revenue in Olympic sports, which we often hear are going to be cut um, if we move to an employment model. And then finally, I'm going to briefly explore how name, image, and likeness um, plays into this. So let's start by framing that discussion, which um, Dan, Josh, and Alicia already did a great job of, of framing the history behind kind of where we are today. But because college sports is tied to higher education, I think that we really have to think about um, what is the value related to college athletics when it comes to moving to an employment model. So the value of revenue producing sports is uh, pretty obvious and easier to answer. But the same question really has to be answered when it comes to non-revenue in Olympic sports. Similar to how an institution's English department is likely not generating revenue, but that seemingly is still a valuable part of higher education. So with that, let's talk about the Dartmouth decision, um, at, which determined, of course, that uh, men's basketball student athletes were employees, and how that analysis might apply for purposes of this discussion. So, so there, briefly, um, in concluding that athletes were employees, the decision really focused on, again, the level of control um, exerted over the athletes and how they were compensated. That compensation, interestingly, came um, in the form of equipment, lodging, tickets, and other factors, because the Ivy League, of course, private um, D1 institutions, doesn't award athletic scholarships. So this was a step beyond 2014 Northwestern, um, <coughs> excuse me, which really focused on scholarship football athletes being employees. What was notable in that Dartmouth decision was that the, the revenue or lack thereof by the men's basketball program was not a factor in um, the regional uh, NLRB's decision to determine that they were employees. So if we take that analysis and setting aside a lot of the caveats that only applies to private institutions, what will happen with this application to public institutions, Many NCAA athletes could easily fall under that analysis in, in becoming employees, notably if you're revenue producing athletes, football, men's and women's basketball, um, perhaps some other sports, but then perhaps all of Division I athletes. Because if Dartmouth men's basketball um, athletes are employees, then Iowa wrestlers certainly are um, under that analysis. So if that's the case, then those athletes would have the right to unionize and bargain with their institution for things like wages, hours, insurance, et cetera, other benefits of their employee, uh, of their employment, excuse me. 
That could happen team by team, sport by sport, school by school. Remains to be seen how that might happen. Although I don't think that that automatically means that all athletes will be deemed employees under that analysis. What about Division II or Division III athletes? Would they fall under that control test or that compensation test? Even some Division I athletes might not. Additionally, Dartmouth, of course, has yet to exhaust its appeal opportunities. Um, as Alicia mentioned, there's the um, joint employer theory and how that would apply to public institutions, which is the majority of Division I institutions are public institutions. The many other legal cases we've already heard facing the NCAA, um, as well as other external factors. So let's assume for purposes of, of my discussion that some or all athletes might be considered employees. And let's talk about how athletics could continue to fund your non-revenue in Olympic sports because again, the, often the only response we hear, I think I read it last week, is that if athletes are employees, then non-revenue in Olympic sports are gonna be cut. And I would say that that is a bit of a red herring argument, particularly the division one level because it assumes nothing else is gonna change about the status quo in that football revenue, TV broadcast, and NCAA basketball tournament distributions currently support all your non-revenue programs. So what are some solutions? First, if in response to the Dartmouth analysis, um, if institutions don't have the political will or the finances, they could simply exert less control and reduce compensation to athletes. So perhaps some sport programs become more like club sports, this is probably more realistic in your Division II or Division III programs, maybe some, some Division I programs. A second solution, spend less, particularly on coaching and upper administration compensation. Given the NCAA and its members are spending a lot of time and money lobbying Congress, they could ask Congress for an antitrust exemption to rein in out of control coaching compensation. Just look at how much Texas A&M had to pay to, to fire their football head coach, $75 million. That could fund Division I athletic departments multiple times over. This has been suggested by some in the industry um, as well as the Drake Group. You could also consider more regionalized conferences and playing schedules, so you're reducing travel expenses, um, which of course could impact TV contracts, but you could also reduce recruiting budgets, which I think the transfer portal um, is changing the way recruiting happens at the Division I level anyway, um, but reducing recruiting budgets so you don't have coaches flying on private charter jets crisscrossing the country or traveling internationally to recruit athletes. Third, the NCAA membership could ask the federal government for help. Um, sports writer Matt Brown, as well as Arizona State professor Victoria Jackson, raised this very point that virtually every other um, developed country has a government department that, that helps support the cost for elite athlete development. It's really expensive. In the US, we don't. That's been delegated to our, our public and private universities. Fourth, to be more intentional about growing current and uh, finding untapped revenue streams, particularly in women's sports. This March Madness is all about Caitlin Clark. We've seen record numbers of viewership uh, for the women's tournament. <coughs> We've also seen record viewership and attendance in other women's sports. For example, last fall, University of Nebraska sold out their football stadium uh, for a women's volleyball match. 92,000 people attended in, per in person. That was the largest crowd for a women's sporting event in U.S. history. Fifth, we could do a, do a nationwide tax on sports gambling. Some states already receive tax revenue um, where it's legalized, and that goes back to some of their state institutions. Why not bring a positive out of a harm um, that sports gambling often causes athletes, um, particularly college athletes, which we've seen. So none of these options are, might be the, the answer or the silver bullet to solve some of these problems. But the point of raising these is that if sports will continue to be a component of higher education in a post-employment world, then athlete spending must reflect that for your non-revenue and Olympic sport opportunities if those are something that are valued in higher education. I think it's also important to consider the significant downsides of cutting sports in response to an employment model. There's legal consequences. Title IX and labor law, an institution that terminates teams in ways that leads to disparity in participation by sex or funding, could run afoul of Title IX. If Division I athletes, let's say, 
are all deemed employees <clears throat> and athletic departments start cutting some but not all sport programs to achieve the financials associated with cost, uh, uh, funding employment, that could be considered an unfair labor practice. Will athletes then be able to file a complaint with NLRB that say dropping track and field is akin to busting a union? And what would the NLRB do? Reputational harm to an institution. College athletics has a transformational impact on fundraising and enrollment something that is not captured in revenue. There's a reliance on support from alumni, donors, and enrollment and retention of current prospective students. We saw this happen during the pandemic when there were schools who faced intense backlash for cutting programs that led to legal challenges, and many of those were, were reversed. I think generally we, we've learned that fans don't root because athletes get paid or don't get paid. They root for the brand, and they care about the brand. I mean, how many young people are going to want to come to Iowa because of Caitlin Clark? For example, Colorado also just saw a 20% increase um, in their, their applicants because of Coach Prime and the success the football programs had, including a 50% increase in black student applicants. Finally, there would be a significant negative impact on the U.S. Olympic pipeline that I just touched on. And this statistic, I think, tells it all. Of the 626 members of Team USA that competed in the 2020 Olympics, 76% of them were current or former student athletes from 171 different one, <clears throat> excuse me, 171 different colleges or universities. With 82% of those athletes who medaled coming from 86 unique schools. I mean, let that sink in. That is a staggering statistic to me in terms of how our US uh, Olympic pipeline is set up. And relatively speaking, it wouldn't take much additional revenue to keep the Olympic sports alive. So in short, the US's competitiveness on the international stage absolutely depends, absolutely depends on opportunities in college athletics. So let's move on to my final point. How does NIL play, play into this? And what about for our non-revenue Olympic sports? So currently, despite the NCAA's restrictions, most NIL deals are really being used as a recruiting retention tool to pay for athletic talent. What's interesting is that this has been keeping athletes in school longer because their earning potential via NIL is often higher probably than any professional opportunities that they might have um, because those opportunities are so, so limited and not always lucrative. So if athletes become employees, does that obviate how NIL is currently being used? Maybe it does in revenue sports, maybe those collectives, or maybe those collectives supporting, supporting revenue sports. It's also worth noting that the current NIL model, I think has little to no return on investment, oftentimes to the collectives or donors providing the money, and is probably not sustainable for the long term, so it's gonna have to change at some point but if college athletes are employees, what if they aren't compensated at a comparable or higher rate to how they are now? There's a lot of athletes who are making really good money um, with their NIL deals. Would they be compensated similarly in an employment model? So maybe NIL compensation continues in some form, um, particularly if non-revenue or, or Olympic sports aren't employees or Maybe those athletes would be willing to take an NIL pay cut in, ex in exchange for more valuable benefits that they could bargain for in an employment model. I think one thing to note is beyond just compensation, it's often lost in this discussion regarding the other issues that, that face college athletes in which they have no representation, which plays into how employment could be beneficial to um, unionize and to bargain for the things that are um, uh, important to them. Furthermore, in the past month, which we already heard about, the current NIL landscape has changed dramatically with the Tennessee and Virginia Attorney, Attorneys General lawsuit, which challenged the NCAA's NIL recruiting ban on antitrust grounds. <coughs> so that, of course, resulted in the preliminary injunction um, against the NCAA from enforcing its NIL policy and bylaws, which has opened up institutions now to choose to be more directly involved with collectives and NIL activities um, in facilitating those opportunities to athletes, 
which moves closer then for institutions having to be compliant potentially with Title IX. <clears throat> There's also a pending lawsuit out there on this very point. Last year, female athletes at the University of Oregon filed a lawsuit alleging a variety of Title IX uh, violations against the institution, including the first time it's been litigated that Title IX applies to NIL opportunities. And if you're not familiar with that case, um, briefly, the, the NIL component, the plaintiffs there are alleging that Oregon and its collective, Division Street, disproportionately provide NIL opportunities to male athletes compared to female athletes. So that lawsuit could be instructive related to that application. And finally, layering athlete employment status on top of all these considerations, the question becomes then, how does Title IX apply to NIL if athletes are deemed employees? How does that affect NIL opportunities, especially for your non-revenue Olympic and women's sports moving forward? So really, I've just raised a lot of questions for you all to think about, and I don't have the answers. Um, <clears throat> and these are difficult and complex questions. Um, but it all comes back, I think, to focusing on uh, what is the value that athletics being part of higher education what is the value of your revenue sports? What is the value of your non-revenue sports and Olympic sports? And how is spending for or to athletes reflected? How can we fairly compensate athletes, excuse me, while retaining what is good and unique about American college sports? Thank you. Well, I want to thank everyone as well. Thank my panelists um, for being here and, and letting me um, hit cleanup. Is that our kind of thing here? So I'll hit cleanup and I'll try to be brief. What we learned today is that the state of college athletics is really good for lawyers. It's really good for my business and it's going to keep being good. Um, but in all seriousness, um, normally when I discuss legal and regulatory issues in college sports, I have a slide that goes behind me, and it's a picture of the Wizard of Oz. I'm from Kansas, so I'm required to have that with me at all times. Uh, but it's the house that fell on the Wicked Witch of the West, and I usually point to the Wicked Witch of the West and say NCAA. Um, that usually gets a big reaction. Um, but today, um, whether it's politicians, state legislatures, courts, deans, um, everyone wants to pick on the NCAA. And it's really the last area of bipartisan agreement. We, we can all agree we hate the NCAA and what they do, and they should be fixed. But unfortunately, we haven't found the solution yet. We haven't yet found the silver bullet. Um, but I think that thinking fails a little bit to acknowledge that we're all here today largely because of the NCAA's successes. The, the popularity of college sports is at an all-time high. The popularity of television in college sports is at an all-time high. Women's sports are at an all-time high. Um, and NCA member schools in the system, as Libby pointed out, produce the most Olympic athletes. So things are going really good in college sports. Let's change everything. That makes very little business sense, and it makes very little practical sense, and I'll tell you why. Um, first, though, I think we do need to acknowledge where we're at. And Professor Jessup did a good job of explaining the billion-dollar enterprise. And the level of revenue that's generated, um, $8.8 billion over eight years in the CBS contract, approximately $7.8 billion for college football, that amount of money creates a system where individuals look at the economic fairness of where that money is going. And the system as it has been designed, is designed to provide that money to its member institutions. That money uh, funds, like it or not, funds all of college athletics. It just does. It funds D Division II, Division III, it funds all of Division I. And the concept that treating football and basketball players as employees um, is tempting. Um, it's tempting to have a single solution. Um, but that not only would be wrong because it's legally inaccurate under the current law and precedent, but, it, but because it would be a significant public policy mistake to decouple athletes 
from a traditional higher education model that has been built about around academic requirements and which has distributions to all athletes. So what we're really, this really comes down to when, it, when a court is talking about this, when uh, you know, any organization, administrative body in LRB, it's economic fairness to the group involved. And there are other ways that commercialization and economic fairness can be dealt with other than employee status. Driving uh, into town today, um, I saw this banner hanging down uh, from the buildings in downtown and it had Caitlin Clark on it, right? So I'm coming into Iowa City, Caitlin Clark, yes, we all are required to mention her, by the way. I don't know if you guys <laughs> dance, uh, you have to mention her. Um, and I thought to myself, uh, wow, like the NCAA in college sports has come a long way because whether it's Nike or a State Farm ad, Caitlin Clark benefits from her own name, image, and likeness now. And that's a good thing. That's a good thing for college sports, and it's a good thing for economic fairness. But the thing I didn't think when I saw that banner, which was awesome, I like it, and took a picture of it, um, I didn't think, hey, Caitlin Clark, you're an employee of the University of Iowa. That's not what, what went through my head. And why didn't it go through my head is because sports in the United States are unique to the world. And athletes, make no mistake, athletes from all around the world want to come to the U.S. to participate in intercollegiate athletics. And they pass up professional opportunities that we're talking about now giving to individual athletes at colleges in order to come to the United States. In part, not only because of the great athletic systems that have been built up because of the money that has been put in this particular system, and we can debate if that you know, money is appropriately distributed. But what we can't debate is that we're number one in medal count as the U.S. Olympic team, that we have an unprecedented number of international student athletes, and that those international student athletes come from European models of sport that don't include higher education. What we also can't dispute is that over the lifetime of a college degree, an individual that gets a college degree as opposed to a high school diploma earns an additional $1.2 million. Not only that, you actually live seven years longer, believe it or not, according to the studies. So this tremendous uh, gift of college athletics in an educational system being undermined in some way by an employment model that will reshuffle the entire deck I don't think is public policy that anyone would get on board with if they understood the facts. Because the reality here is that there's a secret sauce to college athletics. And secret sauce is defined as a special quality or feature uh, that is the chief factor of success of something. And that secret sauce, it's not the college athletes. I love college athletes. I think they're great. I think they do amazing things. I think you have a generational talent here. She, she's a secret sauce for herself. But that's not the secret sauce to the system. It's the brands of the colleges and universities that has resulted in the economic value that is currently resulting in this amount of money available to the system. So if you look at the University of Iowa alone, you have 300,000 or so alumni in 50 states. So you automatically have a footprint of 50 states. Not only that, you have alumni in 127 countries. So you already have an international footprint. And you have an undergraduate base of 22,000. So I think the real question uh, has to be, what value does the athlete bring versus the brand of the university that has, has been around for, you know, since the 1800s? And no one has answered that question. No court, no administrative body. Um, and, I, and I think that while God bless uh, Iowa for having Caitlin Clark in women's basketball, in men's basketball, on that side of the bracket, when I look around, I can't name a student athlete. And that's not saying they're not great and talented. I don't know who they are. But I do know that UConn's still in the tournament, that there's Duke, 
And I definitely knew that Kentucky lost in the first round. That was exciting for everyone. Uh, so sitting here today, you're like, Jason, great. Um, you're, you know, maybe you're a smart guy. We don't know. So what, what about all these cases? You know, why are we here? And it's clear that the NCAA is on the worst losing streak in sports since the Bills' four Super Bowl losses. <laughs> they are terrible at litigating. Um, but I think it needs to be acknowledged as we're having this discussion and we have follow-up questions that the current and well-established law in this country is that college athletes are not employees. The Department of Labor says they're not employees. No federal court has ever said they're an employee. Uh, there's one NLRB case from a regional director. Very questionable if you read that case. Um, Dartmouth would not be the test case I would want to go with, but USC may be. And there may be some joint employment arguments. I think Professor Jessup's going to get me on. Um, but even the Supreme Court in the Alston case, which is what we're all talking about a little bit here, saying, look, Alston changed the game. Uh, it eliminated the Board of Regents. That court was terrified to take on the idea of pay for play and employment status. And the reason they were terrified is because all of their constituents around the country, um, all of Congress understands that we have created a system completely by accident that is the most equitable in the world, is the most successful in the world, redistributes um, the most money in the world to athletes, and also, on top of that, gives opportunity for individuals to have a life-changing education, a first-in-a-lifetime experience. And while there are unfortunate situations that occur everywhere with individual athletes, we cannot dismiss the power of higher education in the lives of these young people. So I'm brief here, but what I want you to take away is that as a stakeholder, as someone who's evaluating this, as a constituent, what we really are talking about here is economic fairness. And fundamentally changing the college sports system by calling athletes employees or giving them employment status would unnecessarily eliminate one of the most important aspects of our culture and the way in which individuals from a variety of backgrounds come together and ultimately create different lives for themselves. So with that, I'll, I'll close and appreciate everyone's time. All right. I've, I've switched to the lapel mic. Can, uh, can you hear me all right? OK, good. I uh, <clears throat> want to start with uh, Leslie brought uh, the first question to the front. And I'll go ahead and just start with an audience question here <clears throat> uh, to the panel. And anybody can take this. What's a, is there or what is a sub issue within this debate that is divisive among the college athletes that we wouldn't expect. Maybe in something that uh, different college athletes may disagree on within this debate uh, that people aren't thinking about. I just have one that comes to mind, and it's the concept of student athlete. So while you have the general counsel of the uh, NLRB saying that the stating of student athlete alone is problematic, I think many athletes like to be identified as student athletes and take pride in that. So I, I think that is uh, one area that would be maybe unexpected uh, to see in this particular debate. Any, anybody else? I, I would completely echo that. Um, and I, it, you know, we, we have to recognize too that within the NCAA membership a, as a whole, Universities are so different across the spectrum, and 
um, the resources that are available to our, our student athletes at the University of Arkansas, I mean, we have a $140 million a, uh, athletics, uh, athletics budget. Our student athletes, they don't want anything to change. And, and I challenge them with a lot of the things we've talked about uh, in my classes, challenge with a lot of the things we've talked about tonight, and they don't want to be considered employees. They want everything paid for. They want their good food and, and all this gear that they get and their first class travel. They want everything to stay the same. Um, even when I when I challenge them, and I, I know that differs on other campuses where the resources aren't the same uh, that they are at my Southeastern Conference uh, institution. When I hear statements like that, and I, I want to be careful with my my words here because I, I'm not putting words into any of my colleagues' mouth, but my um, barometer, my internal barometer, goes up when I hear people like Charlie Baker say. College athletes don't want to be employees. They have it so good. We're feeding them. We're housing them. We're clothing them. Well, guess what? Like, slaveholders housed the slaves. They fed the slaves. They clothed the slaves. Um, and I, I think a lot of this is education. And I, I think, not I don't think, I, I know as someone who's been in this space as an educator for over a decade, um, there, there's a miseducation here where... Um, what employee status means hasn't been fully and clearly laid out to the populace. And there's a lot of fear mongering going on where, well, if you're an employee, we're not going to feed you anymore. The, the training is not going away. There, there's still value in investing in those things. So to me, it, it's not a direct answer to that question, but... Um, what, what I see on the ground is th there's a miseducation and a misunderstanding of what employee status means and what could come from it. To follow up on your observation, Josh, uh, we have a number of current and former student athletes in here. Raise your hand if you're a current or former student athlete. And We've got hands raised from uh, the, the biggest revenue producing sports on this campus. We've got uh, athletes from uh, non-revenue producing sports, athletes from different levels of institutions represented here. Uh, so I'm curious to take a poll, uh, how many athletes, uh, current or former student athletes, raise your hand if you would like to see employee status uh, achieved by student, by student athletes. Okay, a couple of softball student athletes over here, that might be unexpected. Halfway, halfway raising your hands. S depends on, okay, it depends on what, what the collateral impacts might be uh, to a variety of sports, what the scholarship situation might look like. How many of you that raised your hands, sorry Dan. Yeah. How many of you that raised your hands feel like you have enough information to answer that question? I see head shaking. <laughs> it, very good uh, follow up and uh, uh, do, do, Alicia, so uh, you talked about the right to control test. Uh, does the student athlete opinion uh, win the day or should the, 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 the rule of law win the day? No, and, and very kindly, Dan, like that, that type of question really frustrates me because where else in America do we go around polling workers asking them, how do you feel? Like, how, how would you like to be categorized? Like, the, the law, justice is blind. Um, you know, you, you see Lady Justice and she has the blindfold around her eyes and the, the law's the law. <laughs> um, feelings don't matter with the law, it's, it's facts. Good, so, so the courts have to evaluate what the law is. Does, the, does, on the panel, does anybody on the panel think that the student athlete opinion will factor in potentially to anything that Congress might end up doing. 
as they try to protect constituent interests. Sorry, I go ahead. I'm going to jump in. I I don't think Congress is going to fall from the argue for that argument. So. Um, Charlie Baker repeatedly goes out with a talking point that he's talked to thousands of college athletes and he hasn't met one that wants to be an employee. Um, but the issue is, is most of the people, not all of them, but most of the people who hail in the halls of our Congress have a legal background and, and they realize the lack of merit in that. But also, again, similar to the enactment of the Sherman Act in 1890, there is one thing that increasingly is, has bipartisan support in this nation and it is increased rights for college athletes. The first bill um, working to give college athletes greater access to compensation was actually proposed by a then Republican North Carolina congressperson, Representative Mark Walker. He was a one-term congressperson um, who came to Congress from the pulpit as a preacher. And he saw this as a civil rights issue. And so if you look at the breadth of proposed legislation, it crosses both aisles. I think it's also notable that in the 920 Alston decision, one of the most vehement tirades against the current system came from Justice Brett Kavanaugh, who might have been an unsuspecting um, person to pen that concurring opinion. So the one thing I, I think is interesting that we, and, and because I think it is about economic fairness, so when I went to an NAI school and I was a student athlete, um, I wasn't very good, but I, I, I tried, <laughs> uh, dove at ankles. Um, but when we're talking about control and we're talking about FLSA tests, those apply across the board. So if we're talking, we're gonna make a decision that all student athletes are uh, employees versus this economic fairness argument. Is, is that what you're saying or is it only athletes that generate revenue? Only athletes that generate revenue. And I, I, also, I also think there's only athletes that generate revenue. And I also think there's an issue with your economic fairness argument because to the point that you were making earlier that we only recall that UConn is still in the tournament, the fact of the matter is that UConn would not be in a tournament but for the athlete bodies that are playing the game for the university. And so if we're going to talk about economic fairness, um, we need to talk about the increased revenue that's flowed through college sports for the last 40 years and the fact of the matter that college coaches' salaries are increasing 15% year over year during a global pandemic, but the income shared to college athletes has remained fixed at a college scholarship. So I think both arguments fail. Well, I, I will just correct. So the, the money ha isn't just a college scholarship anymore. So now you have cost of attendance plus you have Alston money. So now you have an additional Mantics. additional $10,000 across the board. And those can't just be to revenue generating sports. Those are across the board. So, But they're, they're not across the board because my member institution only pays Alston sums to groups of athletes. Not every college athlete at Pepperdine receives an Alston check. It's, it's targeted to certain groups. To men and women, right? Right, and they're okay. there. So, so they equal the women's sports aren't revenue generating, and yet they're getting Alston money, right? I think. Yeah. <laughs> I, well, I hope so. A Title IX would be in play there. This is this goes back. But and I mean, if, if we want to play Title, Title IX, IX Title no no school is in compliance with Title IX. Okay, so does that mean we shouldn't strive to be in compliance with Title IX? Where, where, were you, where are you going? Tell me, I don't, tell me I don't where you're going. I, I was simply making a point, and you kind of jumped in. I was making a point that, in fact, if, if we're saying we're about control and we're about those tests, that is across the board to any athlete that's involved. But it's that's the not nature, how the test applies. The test the applies team to team. Sport. It's a nature of sport to have certain levels of control in every sport. It's not just about revenue generating sports. So. I get that there's economic inequity. The system has created that. And I would argue that that economic inequity in part is a result of the brands involved and not the athletes involved. Sometimes it's the athletes involved, but not all the time. And the way to address that is what is going on right now, which is third party sponsorship agreements through NIL for those athletes, not to declare those athletes employees of a university. I disagree very vehemently, but for the, I, I'm happy to explain why I disagree, but we might want to move. 
Well, and, <laughs> and to follow up on, on the, this idea of the brands versus the athletes, uh, because a, a question was submitted uh, which asks, um, if the student athletes are not the secret sauce of college athletics, uh, how does that differ from professional athletics? Are professional athletes not the secret sauce of professional athletics? Are teams more valuable than athletes? And I think that offers a good chance, maybe Jason, why don't you take the first shot at, at clarifying what's different about college sports and uh, the, the uh, reduced impact of individual athlete personalities versus brands compared to pro sports where uh, the, you know, uh, the Michael Jordans, the LeBron Jameses, the, the players are front and center. Yeah, I think the, the first difference is the amount of time that athletes uh, can be on a particular campus. So you have four years uh, for athletes to participate. And so during that four year time period, it's much like any other training program to become a professional that you are uh, ramping up to become a possible professional. While you're doing that, in fact, you could be building a brand because you have excellent exposure as a result of the negotiated contracts so that you can catapult into a professional opportunity. But as you're doing that, you're also required to meet academic standards and to get a degree. And that, in and of itself, uh, creates a different system than uh, a professional system. It creates different requirements and incentives. And once you get to the professional level, those individuals can play you know, 10, 20 years, depending on the type of, of sport, and they uh, collectively bargain uh, with the, the um, team and with the NFL for their rights. Um, but as an, as an individual athlete, um, when you come into the University of Iowa and no one knows who you are, and you have no brand whatsoever, you immediately have a Hawkeye on your, on your chest, and that immediately gives you an instant credibility and an instant fan base that doesn't happen everywhere. Anybody on the panel uh, care to add to or respond uh, related to that question? Jason and I are gonna go have a beer later and hash this out, <laughs> but um, we're friends, don't worry. I, Jason, lo love it, lo love the point, but I, I think you're living 10 years in the past. High school athletes have massive social media followings. They have massive brands. Some of them are negotiating deals. There are athletes, um, now listen, he, he has a pretty powerful father, Bronny James, who are driving the popularity of the University of Southern California basketball program. So I, I, I hear what you're saying, but I think that the time has changed thanks to social media. And we're, we're talking about women's sports and I, I don't want to offend my host, but Caitlin Clark chose to stay home. C Caitlin Clark could have left the state of Iowa and gone elsewhere. A lot of us are celebrating the rise of women's sports over the last handful of years, but if you look at what that rise coincides with, it coincides with NIL and women athletes taking marketing control into their own hands, leveraging the tools of social media to do something that historically athletics departments and the NCAA did not optimize. And so when we're looking at the upside of women's sports in the last handful of years, um, you, you have to thank the power of these women's individual brands for that. <laughs> All right, a, a question has come in uh, that I'm gonna direct to you to start off, Josh. Uh, going back to your observation of paternalism uh, by the NCAA, uh, how does the paternalism view factor in when athletes are being taken advantage of when it for the benefit of the university? I guess I'm not sure what, what's meant by uh, to benefit the university. And I'm not, the name's not on the question, but does anybody want to clarify who asked that question about the paternal, the parental view? <laughs> oh, go ahead. Uh, it's a good question. It's, it's on me for not understanding. It's not, it's not on you, don't worry. It's okay. Well, Like, how would employment affect that aspect of it? 
That, that's a great question, and, and thank you for clarifying. Um, <laughs> I, I think, by the way, I, I hope, you know, the, the students in here, I, I, you've heard us say I don't know a lot, or it depends a lot, and I think that's a great lesson for students that I don't know and it depends can be the right answer and can be a good answer. But I think it depends. It depends on how things are bargained, right? If, if, if student athletes become employees, well, what does that relationship look like? I, I think it, it becomes more of, a, of an arm's length relationship between the athletics department and, and coaches and their athletes and it, it resembles more of a professional model. Um, I'm, I'm a, uh, I mean, I've been around college athletics for a long time, and, and I, there are great coaches out there and great people out there who truly care about their athletes. That doesn't necessarily go away, but I think the dynamic changes, right? If, if an athlete knows that they can have their scholarship taken away or something like that, d again, depending on what's bargained, we don't, we don't know what, exactly what that would look like. So um, I know that it, it can be seen as a cop-out answer to say it depends, but I, I really think it depends. Well, and I think we've seen for so long that athletes haven't had a seat at the decision-making table. They haven't had a voice for a lot of um, how your lives are, are dictated and the decisions that are made by adults in the room, for lack of a better term. And I think all of the court decisions, as well as the pandemic and the social justice movement with a lot of athletes has demonstrated that they need, you all need more of a platform to um, voice what are the things that are important to you and how you want the system to change. It, it shouldn't just necessarily be up to um, the adults in the room. You all should have a more meaningful um, seat at the table to provide input. Um, as to what that looks like, and I, I think we're continuing to see that, um, that athletes have, have power in numbers and power in, in um, dictating what, what their experience looks like. And I uh, want to ask, uh, maybe Alicia, if you want to start this off, um, and thank you all for the great questions that are coming in. Uh, there's no way we're going to get to all of them but uh, gonna try to get to as many as possible with the few minutes that we have remaining. Uh, Alicia, with the, the recent Dartmouth decision, and if that holds up under appeal and, and possibly a federal uh, challenge, federal court challenge, what, what are potential bargaining units going to end up being? Is it going to be team by team around the country is there a potential outcome years down the road where all athletes uh, are bargaining as one collective unit like a players association or sport by sport, all softball players and all soccer players uh, negotiating their own employment relationship? Yeah, and, and perhaps that's where I misunderstand Jason's argument related to the right of control be, and the revenue issue. Um, the, the way that I see the units being formed is a sport, sport by sport, and then likely conference by conference. And the, the association has made it clear that it is made up of 1,200 individual member institutions that all have their own unique identities. And so I, I don't think we're facing a reality where every sport in the college athletics ecosystem falls under one union or even one sport across the association. These are, A, different sports. So we, we, we don't have one sport union in the United States. There's a football players union, a women's and men's basketball player union, so on and so forth. Um, so they're, they're going to have different employers. The, if the joint employer theory in the USC case moves forward and is upheld, then the employer would be the conference. And so I, I think the bargaining unit would fall conference by conference, sport by sport. Does, uh, would, they, would they be able to get past uh, the the private public issue. If the joint employer theory, which we, we should know what happens there any day in, in the USC case, 
I think that's going to be the, the tipping point here where tipping point one, I was shocked, frankly, by the outcome of the Dartmouth case. I, I think I disagree a bit with um, Jason on whether or not that's a great case to take forward. I do think it is a great case to take forward because if you can get federal court decisions that non-scholarship, non-revenue producing sport athletes at an Ivy League institution, you go to an Ivy League school for an education, our employees, I think that's the domino that topples over everything else. Um, and I would add it'd be interesting then too, the bargaining units, then finding consensus amongst those bargaining union mm -hmm. units. Is Iowa softball gonna want the same things that Northern Iowa softball wants, for example. Is Kansas men's basketball gonna want the same as uh, Oakland? Um, and, and so how do you find consensus and what are the things that you can agree on and that you're gonna bargain for? And, and, and we're, we're seeing entities emerge, so one to keep an eye out for, they, 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 this domino is going to fall. It's not if, it's, it's when. Like the, the domino is going to fall. If, if I'm wrong, I'll buy you all lunch somewhere. But 10 years from now when I see you, there's going to be widespread employee status of college athletes. And so something to follow would be these organizations that are popping up to stand as the respective unions. So for instance, one is called AO or athletes.org, founded um, by the Jim Caval, founder of Influencer and um, former NFL athlete Brandon Copeland, but they're, they're setting up organizations across the country where football players in the Big Ten are already meeting. And, and so the stakes are being laid and there's people influencing the system to overcome um, some of those hurdles. And you uh, sort of answered what would be a good question as, as we're uh, nearing a close here, what would be a good question to end on we got your opinion of this question, and we'll start with Jason and move down the line. What will this landscape look like in five years? Your best guess. I'll still be employed because we're <laughs> going to be litigating all of these issues. <laughs> because I vehemently disagree with Alicia that we should change a successful model that is the envy of the world um, to go to an employment-based model. We can come up with different distributions. We can come up with a different, and there are areas certainly that the collegiate model needs to improve in, uh, but I think it's still gonna be litigated in the next five years. Okay, Libby? I think it's either gonna be some, some employment model or some other revenue sharing uh, model, but either way, athletes are gonna be compensated outright in the next five years. What that looks like remains to be seen, I think. I'm just asking that the law be upheld. Not, not trying to blow things up, but I, I think the law of the land is pretty clear, and I, I just hope that in, I think what I said is going to take 10 years, so five, five years, we're still in the appellate court system, and I hope the law is being upheld. Um, I think I'm gonna change the question a little bit, if, okay. I, if I may. Um, I've actually, I've ad advised a conference that I do some work for that they, they should write a, a waiver asking the NCAA to set aside the application of, of some of its limits on compensation to start revenue sharing. Uh, I, I, I think it's just a matter of time before a university president or chancellor or a conference uh, challenges uh, on its own some, some longstanding NCAA rules and, and takes the initiative to do that. Um, you know, the NCAA might try to kick them out, right? Um, but. I, I, I think somebody is gonna take a very progressive step and, and do that on their own. Um, and I also think that, I, I know we have some in the room, there's a lot of, and I, but I'm not speaking for them, I, there's a lot of athletics administrators across the country who I think would secretly love the chance to bargain with their athletes and, and eliminate a lot of the um, complaints or, I'm not saying the complaints aren't valid, but a lot of the uh, gripes and, and, and things like that about, that, that have to do with control. I do think there's a lot of athletics administrators across the country who, who would love, uh, and, I, and I know there are, that would love to bargain with their athletes and, uh, and, and figure some of this stuff out. The, the ACC is who takes Josh's point earlier. I, I'm willing to lay that chip down. The ACC offers up revenue sharing first. 
Well, I think we've solved all the problems <laughs> that college athletics is facing uh, right here tonight. Uh, thank you so much to our panel and our audience. Let's give everybody a round of applause. Well done. Wonderful. Well done. Fabulous. Well done, Libby. Great job, buddy. Yeah, yeah, it was, absolutely. And and you you claimed that you were gonna have trouble uh, putting together an argument. Sounded very convincing to me.